I see my wonderful life Almost perfect From the outside In picture frames I have a beautiful wife She's always smiling But on the inside I can hear her saying Lead me with strong Tell myself they'll be fine They're independent But on the inside I can hear them say That song is better than most sermons you're going to hear about Fathers and Father's Day. What a, what a great song. You know, it's kind of interesting to me, I was thinking about this this morning, how differently at church we tend to treat Mother's Day and Father's Day. Have you noticed that? I mean, if you've been coming to church for a while, it's a little bit different, right? On Mother's Day, uh, mom gets a flower or a pretty pen, um, a nice book, some sort of gift, and you get a sermon comparing yourself to the Proverbs 31 woman or Mary, Mother of Jesus, Right? When dads come to church on Father's Day, at best, you get a bookmark, you get a guilt trip, and, and you get a sermon comparing you to Eli, who had the two worthless, wicked sons who died, you know? Sort of a different kind of culture, I know. But listen, I, that being said, dads, we're glad that you're here today. Men, we're glad that you're here, and uh, we want to do something this morning. We just want to honor you. We hope you feel honored all the time by your spouses, by your children, by your church. But men, fathers, will you stand? Let us honor you. Can we honor all the dads in the room this morning? (laughs) 
Now, I'm not oblivious to the fact that Father's Day is not always a joyful occasion for everyone. There are a lot of mixed emotions uh, that accompany a day like the, uh, today. Uh, for some of you, there's heaviness, there's a weightiness today because uh, you wish your dad could be with you today or you wish you could be with him. You wish you could celebrate another Father's Day. Um, I, I know that feeling. Um, my dad, my wife's dad both passed away. I'm not too far from each other just uh, in the last few years. Um, this Father's Day, I won't be with any of my kids for different reasons. Some are on the other side of the country. Some um, are just not able to be here. And so I know there's some mixed feelings. Some of you um, grew up without a dad around. And so even that creates a little bit of resentment and tension and, and anxiety, I guess, and sadness about the whole occasion. But to you, I want to share this passage of Scripture from Psalm chapter 68, the 68th Psalm. It's a promise about who God is, the character and nature of God. And there's a reason today that we're not just about honoring flesh and blood men sitting in these pews today, but we're actually here about honoring the perfect Father, the Heavenly Father. Because Psalm 68, 5 promises us this about God, that He is a Father to the fatherless. He is a defender of widows. In fact, verse 6 says that God also sets the lonely in families. Some of you have come to realize over the span of your life that the best and sweetest family you've got is your spiritual family. People who are brothers and sisters to you, people who have been spiritual fathers to you, I still praise God every Father's Day for the men uh, that God put in my life that were so many spiritual surrogate fathers. That's the sort of thing that God does. Put the lonely in families and put people together for His glory. And He Himself, better than any flesh and blood person, is a father to those in need. So I want you to know this, whoever you are, whatever your situation is, whatever feelings are evoked by Father's Day, to know that God Himself wants to be your father. He wants you to be His son or daughter. He loves you and He wants to provide the family for you that is perfect. It's not like the families of this world. It's not like the brokenness of this world. It's not like the failures of men like me in this world who are fathers, but it's perfect and that's who God is. Let's pray to Him this morning. God of creation, sovereign King of the universe, ruler and judge over all who live. There are so many titles we could ascribe to You, but the greatest and best to us is Father. You are Abba Father to us because we are Your children. We are not strangers to You. We are not aliens outside Your gates. We are not Your enemy. We are Your children. We are Your sons and daughters. You have adopted us. You have made us Your own. And it is for forever. You have blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Many of those we cannot even imagine yet. Father, we love You and we thank You. My Father, I pray that today You would be a Father to everyone in this room. That every person in this room would call out to You as Father and trust You and become Your sons and daughters. They would love you because you love them first, and they would respond to your love. And Father, they would know that you fill in all the gaps, all the things that we are lacking, all the love that we need, the identity that we so sorely, deeply desire, the future that you hold. It's all. It's all from you. So, Father, may they find that today. Thank you for loving us. Heal our broken hearts. Give us a renewed hope for the future. Show us how we ought to live so that we may be more pleasing to You in everything that we do. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today I want to give you sort of the flyover overview of a book I think that if rightly applied could be absolutely life-changing to you. Now that doesn't make it different than any other book in Scripture, but there's a uniqueness to the Proverbs for the practicality of real-life stuff that just can't be overemphasized. The Proverbs has 31 chapters. You probably knew that already. Some of you have probably already adopted the spiritual discipline of reading a Proverbs every day. Is there anybody who's doing that or has done that, reading one Proverbs every day for a month? Does anybody do that? Have done that? You know the practical power of the Word of God instructing us on how to live. Now I want to ask you a big picture question. When I think about this theme today, what is it that dads are supposed to do? I mean, what, what did dads do? Why did God put us here? And you're not going to get this answer from secular media. You're not going to get this answer from movies and television because let's be honest, guys, 
the dads in this room, most often when we look at ourselves through the lens of television or movies, we are presented as idiots, right? We're the bumbling fools. We're the ones that know nothing. We're the blustery blowhards. We're the jokes. We're the butt at the end of the jokes. But God has called us to something that is profound. In fact, the first image that our children ever get of God is in us. Is there anything bigger or more important than that? God has empowered us. He's called us. He's commissioned us. He's given you a mission, a job. To represent Him well, to glorify Him much, and to lead. Lead your families in godliness and towards God Himself. And in Proverbs, there's some powerful wisdom that I think you and I need to understand and appropriate. Put it into work. Put it into action. What God wants us to do. And So I ask you this question to help frame what I'm going to share with you shortly this morning. Why do you think Solomon wrote the Proverbs? What what guided him to do this? Now obviously, if this was Sunday school, the Sunday school answer is always Jesus, right? What guided him to write the Proverbs? Well, Jesus, of course. I get that. God wanted him to write it. And God inspired it. But what was on the mind of Solomon? What was in his heart? What was driving the passion of this? That he would write the things he wrote that are so specific about real life nuts and bolts stuff that if you change some of the words, you change the scenario just a little bit, it could have been written exactly for the 21st century. Well, to get our answers, let's look at Proverbs chapter 1. There's two passages of Scripture I'm going to want you to flip between today. Proverbs 1 and Ecclesiastes 2. So if you want to find those and kind of put your finger in them, I'm going to want you to flip between them for just a moment. Let's start with Proverbs chapter 1. Let's look at these first six verses to get a clue. Proverbs 1, verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Here's your purpose. To know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction and wise dealing and righteousness, justice and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. So the easy answer as to why Solomon wrote the Proverbs would be this, in a word, wisdom. Wisdom. He he wanted to convey a life of wisdom. But let's look a little closer, a little more closely at Solomon and his own life. Because when you think about wisdom in Scripture, you're probably, if you have been steeped in much church life, you know Solomon is touted as the wisest man who ever lived. Of course, uh, secondary only to Christ himself. Let's look a little bit about this wise man's life for a second by his own account. And I do believe Ecclesiastes is penned by him. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. In those first nine verses, you have this synopsis of the sort of life that Solomon lived. And to be honest with you, it's a dream life for most of the people that live today. It's a dream life for a secular thinking person, for a person who doesn't have Christ in their life or doesn't have God-centered goals and priorities. I mean, here's what Solomon went after. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. I said of laughter, it's mad of pleasure. What is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine. Look at verse 4. I made great works, built houses, planted vineyards. Verse 5. I made myself gardens and parks and planted them all kinds of trees. Verse 6. I made myself pools from which to water the forest for growing trees. Verse 6. Seven, I bought male and female slaves. I had slaves that were born in my house. I had great possessions of herds and flocks more than anyone. Verse 8, I gathered for myself silver and gold more than anyone. Singers, men, women, concubines. Let your parents tell you what that one means. The delights of the sons of men. And he says this, So I became great and I surpassed all who were before me. I mean, again, if you're making a list of the stuff the world wants, the stuff, listen, listen, parents, The stuff, if you don't give them something better to want, if you don't give them something more everlasting to want, if you don't give them something more life-giving to want, it's the stuff your kids are going to want. They're going to want pleasure. And they're going to want to be surrounded by stuff, by money and affluence and fame. This is what they're going to be after. They're going to think life is made of all this. And so Solomon says, this was my life. And he doesn't say so we'll applaud it. In fact, he says it so we'll pity him because he goes on to say, In verse 10, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. And when I had it all, listen to his words. Verse 11, I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. Here's the summation of my life. 
Behold, all was vanity and a striving after the wind. You go try and catch the wind. Rope it in. See what you got. See what you put in the bag when the day is over. He said, and there was nothing to be gained. Do you get the harsh contrast? I had everything and I had nothing. I had everything everybody in this world apart from Christ wants. And when I looked at it and I dumped the bag over at the end of my life, you know what was in it? Air. There was nothing in it. And here is the most tragic statement about the man's life. Verse 17 of Ecclesiastes 2. So I hated life. So I hated life. Now let me ask you a little more deeply why you think Solomon wrote a book like Proverbs. Because Proverbs is written by a man who knew the dark side of the false promises of this world and he wanted something better for his sons. He wanted something better for them. He says, I've been down that path that you're going, except the difference between Solomon and most of us is he went after it and he got it. We just spent all of our lives going after it. And what Solomon is writing here, he writes these Proverbs because he loves his son and he wants him to have a better life than he had. He didn't want him to waste his life on things that don't matter. And he surely didn't want him to end up at the end of life with an empty bag of life saying, it's for nothing. This was for nothing. What have I done with my life that's been for nothing? I hate it. Saul discovered some things the hard way. Well, I would say he discovered a lot the hard way. And he wanted to save his son from his pain. And the only way he could do that was to teach his son to live wisely. Is there a dad in this room? Is there a dad in this room that does not want for their sons or daughters a better life than they had? Is there one of us who does not want that? But let me challenge you today, as much as I can from these brief words I'm going to share from Solomon's life, that it is to want more for them than that they be more well-known than you. Then that they have more friends than you. That they have more stuff than you. That they have greater wealth than you. That they have a better time than you had. May your desire be for them. What Paul writes in Colossians chapter 2, verses 2 through 3, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. May your desires for the better life you want for them mean that they know Christ better than you. That they know the wealth of the riches of Christ more deeply than you. That they want Jesus even more than you have wanted Him. And that they follow Him more closely even than you have followed Him. And that they love Him more dearly. They serve Him more faithfully. And that they avoid the pitfalls of life. May you want that life for them more and more. That's what Solomon is writing. He's writing about a life of wisdom. Let's take a moment to find what wisdom is, okay? Because it's not so easily summarized. In fact, I, I would guess if I ask everybody to take out a little slip of paper today, write down the word wisdom on it, and what it means, we would get a lot of different definitions. Now maybe by pulling those together, we'd probably come fairly close to the target if we could summarize and reach a lowest common denominator. But let me give you some thoughts on it. The basic idea is that wisdom is the skill of living. It's practical. It's the knowledge that helps you know when to act and speak and how to react to different situations. It's an ability to avoid problems and it's ability to rightly handle problems when they come without collapsing, without giving in to temptation under pressure, without choosing the wrong thing. It's not intelligence, pure and simple. But it can't be divorced from intelligence either. But that's not the focus. Raw intellect knows facts and information. It knows that. Wisdom knows how. Wisdom knows when. Wisdom knows why. In fact, in the Proverbs, wisdom is actually attributed sometimes even to animals who could not be really considered intelligent beings necessarily, but yet they know how to navigate life well. In Proverbs 30, you see this passage of Scripture says four things on earth are small, but they're exceedingly wise. The ants 
are a people not strong, yet they provide their food in the summer. The rock badgers are a people not mighty, yet they make their homes in the cliffs. The locusts have no king, yet all of them march in rank. The lizards you can take in your hands, yet they're in the king's palaces. So ants, lizards, rock badgers, and locusts. Exceedingly wise. Why? Because they navigate life well. And that is the best definition I could possibly give you about what wisdom is. In fact, I would encourage you to write it down today. Wisdom is this. Wisdom is the ability to navigate life well. What I want for my sons and for my daughter is that they would grow in their ability to navigate this life well. And all that that means. That their priorities would be God-centered. That their values would be God-glorifying. That the aim of their life and the energies they expend towards that aim would be worth it. In fact, what I want for them is the very opposite that Solomon said he had for himself. I went after all these things, and when I got through and I had them, I realized what I really had was zip, zip, zilch, not. I got a bag full of air. It was so much nothing. Obviously, the need in Proverbs for wisdom is very personal. Solomon refers to his son. He says the words, my son, at least 26 times. Now, obviously, there are times in Proverbs where he's speaking to a group of people. Sometimes he's speaking to foolish people. Sometimes he's speaking to wise people. But always driven at the heart of it is this personal appeal to someone that means something to him here in his heart. The need for wisdom is also very, very practical. And that's the point of what I'm sharing with you today. It's not just the accumulation of so many facts. Listen, there's some broken-hearted moms and dads in this room whose sons and daughters know a lot of facts about God. They could pass all sorts of biblical pop quizzes. They know names and characters and places and events. But wisdom is not information. Wisdom is the application of that in a God-oriented way. It's the ability to navigate through whatever life brings, temptations, hardships, difficulties, successes, succeeding through wins, handling adversity, and everything in between well with wisdom. Some of the most practical life skills you can imagine are in Proverbs. I thought about summarizing all 32 chapters, but time would not allow our 31 chapters. So I just give you the first several. Chapter 1, how do you face peer pressure in a bad crowd? Chapter 2, how do you guard yourself on the daily path of life? Just the routine of life. Not the badness, but the busyness. Chapter 3, what do you do when you're confused and you don't know what to do? What, did you, what do you do when everything you tried just didn't work? Chapter 4, how do you apply the Word to every situation in your life in order to grow as a person, to get better and better? Chapter 5, how do you avoid the unique pain and consequences of sexual sin? There are some moms and dads in this room that would do anything if their sons and daughters could avoid the unique pain and consequences of their own sexual sins. Proverbs 5 deals with that. And so many other subjects. Overcoming bad habits. Good habits that a, that a wise person possesses. How to handle your money. How many of you dads in this room wish your sons and daughters would learn better lessons about handling money than you did when you were young? Or maybe now, maybe yesterday. How to handle difficult people. How many of you got difficult people in your life and you wish your sons and daughters could learn some lessons from that? How to be a true friend. How to be a faithful spouse. In this first section of Proverbs that I read to you just a moment ago from chapter 1, Solomon adds these words to the definition of wisdom. They're wisdom's companions. They're the support beams, if you will, that help us understand what wisdom is. Everything that undergirds wisdom, I want to hit them very quickly so we understand the terminology of what it is that we're trying to impress upon the next generation. These are the words that he uses there and their definition. The first one is instruction. Instruction carries the idea of discipline, a parent's correction that results in the building of a child's character. No one can ever become a wise person without discipline. You agree? doesn't matter. You don't have to agree. That's right. That's true. No one grows without their character being adjusted. I've had some character adjusting moments in my life. Have you? It's instruction. It's instruction with discipline. Understanding. 
Understanding is the ability to grasp a truth with insight and discernment. How many of you have a son or a daughter that is the perpetual asker of the question, why? Yeah, but why? Why? Because I said so, that's why. How many of you are guilty of saying that? That's all you need to know because I said so. Listen, I would challenge you. I've been there many times and said that same response. But listen, you've got that young mind that's fertile, ready to grow. Give them the why. Give them the why of wisdom. Give them the why of the command of God. Do you know every command of God is profitable? Do you know that? Do you know why it is? Show them the why. Prudence is the next term he adds. Prudence. It's the kind of intelligence that sees the reasons behind things. People with prudence can think their way through complex matters. Don't you want your sons and daughters to do that? Make wise decisions? Knowledge is the next word he used. Knowledge is a word, again, it's not really so much about skill. Because, I mean, it's not so much about info, it's about skill. The same word is used frequently in the Old Testament, and sometimes it's used like teaching the skill in hunting. Genesis 25. How many of you men have taught hunting skills to your sons or daughters? Raise your hand. You've done that? Or at least gun safety skills. Okay, pacifist. Fishing skills. Does that work? All right, we on the same page yet? You know, we want them to have these basic skills, right? I want my son to be able to change his own tire, check his own oil, um, point the gun in the right direction, you know, those kind of things. Why would we not, with the same sort of intentionality, teach them how to make wise decisions about life? To pull our sons and daughters aside and say, listen, this is what temptation looks like. This is how it's going to come. And this is how you're going to have to respond to it. Okay? This is what pressure is going to feel like. This is when you're going to become more vulnerable because you're tired and worn out. This is when you're going to think you deserve to sin. This is when you're going to be weakest. This is when it's going to be the hardest. All these things to teach them. That same sort of knowledge is often also used for sailing. 2 Chronicles 8.18, playing a musical instrument. Skill and the ability to distinguish. Discretion. Discretion is the ability to devise plans after understanding a matter. I don't know if this is just my family, if this is cliche, if this is a generality, if this is just how it goes. I don't know. Some of you who are better and wiser and more experienced at parenting can tell me this. Why is it you can have a 21-year-old son who doesn't have a clue what he's going to do for the rest of his life, but a 16-year-old daughter can tell you everything, including where she's going to live and how many kids she's going to have? I don't know how that is. I wish... There was a little more discretion to develop a plan. Learning is the next word he uses. Learning to lay hold of, to grasp, to acquire, to buy. When you grasp something with the mind, you've got it. I memorized a lot of facts going through school. And grad school, master's degree, doctoral degree, and those kind of things. But the things I really grasp, those things stick. And that's different. And then counsel. Counsel is related to the verb to steer a ship. Counsel is the wise guidance that moves one's life in the right direction. And moms and dads, you forever will be till the day you die the most valued, most necessary, most God-ordained counselor that your children have. Guide them the right direction. But behind all of this is a verse that unlocks all the Proverbs. One verse that is the key to the entire book. No matter what it's talking about, no matter what the theme is, no matter what the practical challenge is or skill set, one verse unlocks it all, and it's Proverbs 1.7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Did you catch that? That is a sharp contrast here. Now, most of us would like to think of ourselves uh, maybe somewhere in between. You know, I'm not a fool. I mean, I'm not all I ought to be. I'm, I'm, no, I'm nobody's fool. Scripture allows no mushy middle. There are those who fear the Lord and then those who live as fools. What is the definition of a fool per Scripture? The fool has said in his heart, there's no God. Foolishness by its very nature denies the authority and sometimes even the reality of God Himself. So our sons or daughters are either going to live as practical fools, functional atheists, who lives as if God is not real, God does not exist, His rules are not binding, His love for them is not legit, and His plans for them are not good, and the future is not true. Or else they will live as people who have a righteous, reverent 
Fear for God, acknowledging Him first. Fear of the Lord. This same verse, the same statement is amplified in Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. There are at least 18 references in Proverbs to the fear of the Lord. And if you read all those references as you begin to skim through the Proverbs looking for that theme, what does it mean to fear the Lord? You get a pretty good picture of it. Because one who fears the Lord recognizes that God's Creator, that gives him authority. God is sovereign and king. God is ruler and judge, but God is also the loving, righteous, good, and perfect Father who longs to give good gifts to His children. And the righteous person, the person who fears the Lord, knows Him this way. The fear of the Lord as a child to a father is a little different than, say, the fear of an employee to an employer, the fear of a student to a teacher, fear of a criminal to a cop or a slave to an owner, or whatever analogies through history you might find, this fear is different. When children fear the Lord, and fear Christians fear the Lord, much like children ought to learn the reverent respect for their parents, knowing that not only can their parents hurt them, in whatever way that may be, but also because they can hurt their parents with their choices and decisions. And as God's children, we know the same. This is not with callous indifference. This is not with cold, unbending rules that He governs over us, but is with a heart of mercy and grace, compassionate love for us. Charles Bridges defines fear of the Lord this way. It's that affectionate reverence by which the child of God bends himself humbly and carefully to his Father's will. Knowing his Father's wrath is so bitter, but his love so sweet, that hence springs an earnest desire to please him. And because of the danger of coming short from his own weakness and temptations, a holy watchfulness that he might not sin against him. That was David's relationship with his perfect father. I might not sin against you. So I've asked one big question, and I want to follow that one big question up with an even bigger one today. The first question is this, so why did Solomon write these words? Why are they useful to you? Why should you read them with your family? Why should you read them and embed them in your own mind and heart? Why should you teach them and share them? Because you want a life that's lived well and wisely. Because you want your sons and daughters to navigate through life well. Now here's my second question. So what do dads do? So what do dads need to do when it comes to wisdom? Well, I guess the first is most important and also most obvious. Dads, we need to be wise enough to follow the wisest, to follow Jesus ourselves passionately and faithfully. If you were to list the, if you were to list the descriptive terms you think apply to you as a father in your home, What would be on your list? How many of you would have on your list as a father, would have on your list provider? Raise your hand if you think that's part of my role as a dad. Provider. I hope so. The Bible says he who doesn't take care of his own, literally provide for his own, is worse than an unbeliever. Provider. How many of you would put on your list protector? It's part of my role to be a protector for my home. Dads, husbands, what is it that you most need to protect? your family from? Let me rephrase that. What is probably the most dangerous thing to your own family, dads? Your own sin. Most dangerous thing to your family, dads, is your own sin. Most dangerous thing to your marriage is your own sin. Most dangerous thing that's going to affect your children is what you do that's contrary to the will of God. If you're serious about being a protector, be wise enough to follow Jesus yourself passionately and faithfully. And then in line with what I shared about what I believe is Solomon's heart, number two, hope and expect that your children will exceed you in how they live. That they will exceed you. See, here's a pervasive lie that the enemy whispers into the ears of moms and dads. 
It may not be in these words exactly, but this will be sort of the gist of it, the thrust of it. You can't expect them to do things that you didn't do yourself. Or here's a flip side of that negatively. All the things that you did growing up, and I'm not trying to stir up your guilt or your bad memories here, things that are long gone and forgiven, but all those things that you did, you ought to expect they're going to do those too. You can't expect that they don't do the things that you did too, right? And that's sort of the secular mindset about parenting. You failed morally, ethically, sexually, whatever. Expect that they will too. That's what the enemy's going to tell you. But what I'm telling you today is something like I believe Solomon was saying to his son, listen, I want something better for you than that. My goal for my sons, for my daughter, is not that they live as well as I did, but that they live better. That they live better. So that's why we've got to do number three. We've got to teach and model what it is that we expect. You catch those two together? You've got to teach it. You've got to come out of your mouth with all the whys. With all the wisdom, with all the experience, it's got to come out of your mouth, but it's also got to show up. And you know what? This is true not just with parenting. This is true with any sort of spiritual leadership. This is what Paul told Timothy. Paul told Timothy, Timothy, you've got to watch your life and your doctrine closely, Timothy. These two things go together. They can't really be separated for you to do this legitimately. And number four, you've got to pray that they too will find and follow Jesus. Because there's no magic formula of parenting. I was digging back through some old sermons, right? See if I had any catchy stories, illustrations, poignant things I could share with you from Father's Day or parenting messages past. And so I uncovered this message on parenting that I had given in my previous church some years ago. And so I look back at the date, and the, the irony of it is I think my kids were like uh, five, four, three, and one at the time. So I'm giving all this wisdom you know, about parenting. This is how you do this. Right? This is easy. And then I discovered this truth. Small children make small messes. Big children make big messes in life in general. And I realized I really didn't have much to say on this subject. I'm not sure I still do. But I do know this. There comes a point in time where my influence is secondary to the influence of peers and friends. Coaches, professors, teachers. And where their influence even must give way to the influence that is the greatest in my life. And that's Jesus Christ. And what I want most for my sons and what I want most for my daughter is that they will find and follow Jesus and they will discover Proverbs 1, verse 7, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That they will find, as Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy. Now that's understanding. And that they will want to know God and love Him and follow Him. And I'm going to pray for that. I'm going to pray for that. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to do invitation in a couple different ways. I want to invite you. I don't want to manipulate you. You do it as you see fit. But I want to invite some dads to come pray here, right here this morning for the families. For their sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters, that they might know the fear of the Lord and the beginning of wisdom. That they might know the knowledge of the Holy so they might love Him and follow Him. That they might know and follow Jesus. That they might live lives better than ours. That they might look back when life is all over and realize, I love it. I did what God wanted me to do. I lived like God wanted me to live. I was a person God wanted me to be. And I'm thankful for my dad, my mom, my grandparents, my grandfather. So, dads, we're going to start an invitation like that. I'm going to ask Sylvia just to begin to play. And all over this room, I'm going to invite dads just to slip out of your seats and you come and pray. Everyone else, if you'll just bow where you are. We're going to have some time just praying for families this morning. All over this room.